بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله So continuing on with our video series, we're going to be covering again another property of an ism. So just as a quick recap, the four properties are, the first being definiteness, which can be divided into two categories. It's either going to be specific or non-specific. By specific, we mean it's referring to an entity which is known, such as the apple. By non-specific, it means that it's referring to an ambiguous entity, such as a apple. It's not a particular apple, it's just a general apple. The second is gender, and when it comes to Arabic isms, they can be either be male or female. By default, all are male, but then there are particular signs which you can look to in order to see if something has been made female. The third is number. So we said that in Arabic, there is the singular, singular, dual, and plural. And then also plural can be divided, further divided into the sound plural and the broken plural. And then finally, there's status, which is actually our topic for today. And just in a nutshell, status pretty much tells you the purpose of a word in a sentence based on the ending that it has designated to it. Right. So usually on the end of words, you'll see, a f on, especially on the end of isms, you'll see them with a fatha, dhamma, or kasra. Now that diacritical mark that's found on the end of an ism is actually the key to figuring out what that ism is actually doing in that sentence. So what does this look like practically? So let's take an example of a verbal sentence where we have a verb here, which is nasara. It means he helped. Now when a verb occurs and you're dealing with a verbal sentence, there's usually two other components that show up. There is the doer. So the one who is performing the action of the verb, then there's the receiver, the one who's receiving the action. Now the doer is usually known by a dhamma on its ending, and the receiver is known by a fatha on its ending. So when I say nasara umarun zaydun, this translates to umar being the doer, helped zaid, right? So zaid is the one receiving the help, while umar is the one doing the action of helping. Now, this could have been reversed. We could have said, Nasara Umaran Zaydun, which would have meant Zayd helped Umar, right? And, and then in that case, it would have been that Zayd is the doer, and then Umar is the receiver of the help. Now, distinguishing between the receiver and the one doing the action all comes down to that ending. The receiver is going to be with a Fatha ending, and the doer is going to be with a Dhamma ending. Now, verbal and nominal sentences and all of those purposes and whatnot, we will study in detail in the coming lessons. But for now, it's important to just know and take this example as a means of driving it home that endings will tell you what something is doing in a sentence when it comes to an ism. So how do we get these endings down? Well, it's really critical, actually, to just tie it all up in this thing that we call the Muslim chart. By memorizing these two charts that we're going to put before you, you can actually get this stuff down actually quite simply. And it will tie together gender, number, and status all in one place. So what does this look like? So this is an overview of the chart. And essentially, it shows you three different statuses. There is rafa, nasab, and jar. And each one of these statuses will have different implications when an ism takes it on at. Um, when an ism takes on that state, it will, it will change what its purpose is in the sentence. But what's critical for us now to understand is how do we identify it? So when we're dealing with a masculine ism, when it's rafa, it's simply muslimun. And that will be with the dhamma on the end, we'll know that it's singular and it's rafa. When it's dual, if it has an any ending, that means, yes, it's dual, and that means it's also rafa. If it has an una ending, that means it's plural, and it means it's also rafa. So those are three signs of rafa for a masculine ism. So the dhamma ending, the ani ending, and the una ending. When it comes to nasb, in the singular, it has a fatha ending. When it comes to the dual, it has an aini ending. And when it ha comes to the plural, it has an ina ending. And what's interesting about the nasb and the jar is that they're actually pretty similar for the dual and sound plural. They're actually the exact same. So for dual, they're both aini, aini, and for sound plural, they're both ina, ina endings, right? 
They only differ when it comes to the singular. When it's nusb, it will be represented by a fatha on the end, and when it is a um, jar, it will be represented by a kasra on the end. To tell the difference between their dual and sound plural, a lot of that's really going to come from context, when you know what triggers them to go into those states. It's really important to keep in mind that by default, just like how all isms were non-specific by default, just like how they were all masculine by default, by default their status is rafa. Something's going to have to come in to change it to make it nasb or make it jar. And that's a critical point to remember. So this is what it looks like when it's masculine. It's muslimun, muslimani, muslimuna, musliman, muslimaini, muslimina, muslimin, muslimaini, muslimina. Memorizing this chart will save you a lot of time. I guarantee you that. It's a quick reference to tell you when you see a word what its state is, what its number is, and also what its gender is. So it's really helpful to get this down. So what does it look like when it comes to the feminine? When it comes to the feminine, it's very similar. Um, <clears throat> the only difference that you'll really see is with the sound plural, right? So with the feminine, um, it's still going to be a dhamma ending, so muslimatun. With the dual, it's still going to be an andi ending. Just when it comes to the sound plural now, in the case of rafa, it's actually an atun ending, right? So that's a little bit of a difference there. When for the nasab in the jar, in the singular, the nasab is once again represented by a fatha, so muslimatan, and the jar is represented by a kasra, muslimatin. Both of the duals will once again be the same, just like how we had seen with the masculine, and it's with an aini ending, Aini ending, just like the masculine. And then for the feminine sound plural nasab and jar, it's a tin in terms of the ending. So remember, for the sound plural masculine, it was una, ina, and ina. Well, the real major difference for the sound plural feminine is it's just simply a tun, a tin, and a tin. And once again, memorizing this chart will come in handy drastically because it will teach you how to deal with male and female isms when they come along and you know exactly where they lie on the chart. So really just getting down this chart is a tremendous service to yourself. So let's just do like a quick example. Let's take a word such as um, uh, mu'minun. We'll do mu'minun. So if we put it through the chart, it would be mu'minun, mu'minani, mu'minuna, mu'minan, mu'minaini, mu'minina, mu'minin, mu'minaini, Mu'minina. Then if it was feminine, it would be Mu'minatun, Mu'minatani, Mu'minatun, Mu'minatan, Mu'minataini, Mu'minatin, Mu'minatin, Mu'minataini, Mu'minatin. And that's pretty much status in a nutshell. It really just comes down to mastering these two charts and knowing when exactly to use them. When you see a word that fits any of these patterns, you know exactly where it lies in the chart and it will tell you exactly what its status is. As turn to what makes a word nasab jar and what does it mean when it's rafa, that's something that we'll study actually in the coming lessons, inshallah. Right now, we just really wanted to get down knowing what the different statuses are and how they look across different numbers and different gender. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.